Church say amen. amen. You brought your Bibles with you. Would you turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 18? 1 Samuel chapter 18. Shine on me. Shine on, on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine. take this word today and would you challenge us and convict us. Father, would you lead us in the way of all truth. Father, would you make us anew. Father, would you create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in us. Father, I pray that this word today will reach the masses. I pray, Father, that it will reach heights unknown. I pray, Father, again, that it will challenge us to be more like you would desire for us to be. I pray that it would convict us to have a desire to do what is right and what is pleasing. I pray, Father, that it would also give us confidence and give us a clear understanding that we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. And I, Father, pray that we see the importance of following your holy and divine word. And Father, I pray that lives will be made all the better because we have leaned, depended, and trusted in you. Father, I pray for those that are not here today, but they are still listening wherever they are. I pray, Father, that they understand that even though they are not here, you are there. I pray that they understand, Father, that you are an ever-present God. And that you will meet a person in his very condition, 
and his very position. Father, again, I say thank you for all that you have done. And I worship you simply because you are God and that you are deserving of all honor, all praise, and all glory. And it's to you both now and forever. And I pray this prayer in your darling son Jesus' name. And all the congregation said together, Amen. 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 Again, we thank God for another day that was not promised to us. We thank him for a reasonable portion of health and strength. We thank him for his almighty power and his amazing grace. We thank God for showering blessings over our lives showering his blessings on a people that was not deserving of it. We thank God for his unmerited favor. We thank him for being the only true and living God our Savior. I don't know about you, but I woke up this morning thanking God and praising him. Not just because I'm still here, but because I'm still his. One of my favorite scriptures that I've learned to hold in my heart, in all things I have learned to be content. I've learned how to be a base. And I've learned how to abound. I'm glad that it's not dependent on if I can lift myself up or if man lifts me up. That doesn't make a difference as to the joy that I have. Then I'm also glad that man can't tear me down. Man can't put me down. Because I've learned how to be a base. And I've learned how to abound. I've learned how to be content in all things. I've got a Savior. That if I have no money in my pocket. He's still on the cattle of a thousand hits. I woke up a little different this morning. I woke up thinking about the goodness of our God. But he has given us a word today that is a challenging word. From the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 18. And I'm just going to read verses 1 through 5. But as always, I challenge you to read, start at verse, I mean, chapter 17. And read all the way through verse 18. I mean, chapter 18, excuse me. And, and see what God has done through friends and love. Two words that I think we often just kind of throw out there. Two words we throw out there with ease, but we don't always accept the challenges of these two words, friendship and love. Hmm. Now we call anybody friends. And then sometimes we define our friendship by those that make us happy. Those that look like they agree with everything that we agree with. And then we throw out that love. But we can only love those. Think like we think. Act like we act. 
but I think about Jesus. When I didn't think like he thinks, when I did not, did not act the way he wanted me to act, when I did the very thing that he told me not to do, guess what? I found out he still loved me. Still loves me and his care. And we sang the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. But I'm going to get to the message, but I just got to get it out. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, and it reads, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan came, uh, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. For that day, from that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it successfully that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the people and Saul's office as well. I want to preach for a little while about a difficult love dynamic. A difficult love dynamic. And just to help you understand, or get a, the message of my subject, I want to ask, or ask, are you willing to follow it? Are you willing to follow this difficult love dynamic? Let me start off by saying that about this love dynamic. We're looking at three individuals that I say are connected by a form of love or a degree of love. But there are some decisions that have to be made in this dynamic or in this love triangle that will cause division and separation. And it will cause, and it is because you have to make some decisions of how do I operate in this dynamic of love. Right. We have Saul the king. We have his son Jonathan, whom he loved. And then we also have David, whom Jonathan loved with his, the Bible says, with his complete soul. The Bible says that Jonathan loved David to the degree that even a man couldn't love a woman. He said he loved him with his whole soul. He loved him with everything in him. And, that, and it shows here that after they had a conversation, Saul and David, Jonathan sat close by, listened to the conversation, but in his eyes and in his heart, he fell in love that very moment with David. And because he fell in love with David, he was going to have to make some decisions against his father, whom he also loved. So now he's in a difficult love dynamic. This dynamic that I'm, when I'm using this word dynamic, meaning that there must be some changes made, some changes of operation, some changes of how I deal with people or deal with a certain person. And I'm asking right now, before I get started in the sub subject, are you willing to follow this difficult love dynamic? Are you willing to make some changes 
and go against some people that you love and go against some things that have brought you bounty in life. Jonathan was the king's son. Jonathan lived high on the hog. Jonathan had everything that his little heart desired. But I'm in love with a shepherd. I'm in love with a man that doesn't have very much. I'm in love with someone that doesn't have a lot to offer or bring to the table. And at this point, the father had brought him in and brought him away from his own home and put him in his army. And can you imagine the king's son being in love with a person that didn't even have rank in the army? Because at this point, David was just now beginning to establish himself. And really, turmoil was just getting ready to happen. Chaos was just now getting ready to break loose. Because David had just been brought in out of the field and then put in an army where he had no rank. Or, well, let me say it this way. He really wasn't even officially in the army yet. He was brought in because the army and Saul wouldn't fight the enemy. And the Saul had already said that if I can find anybody, you don't have to be in the army. If I can find anybody that will defeat Goliath, I'll take care of him and his household. He'll never have to worry about anything. And he couldn't find anybody in his army or anybody in the land. So they ended up at, I believe, Jesse's house, where he had already had some of Jesse's sons. So maybe it was some doubt even in the beginning. I already got some of your boys in my army, and they won't fight Goliath. So what else do you have around here? And after looking and looking, they find a little ruddish redhead boy that don't look like much of anything. The father didn't even have him come up when they was looking for somebody. Maybe because he was too young or maybe because he just didn't look like he was ready to fight in the army. But now we have him here talking to Saul after defeating Goliath. And he's talking to him now. And here we find that the uh, king's son so I love him. I don't know much about him, but I love him. And here's where the difficult love dynamic began. Can you imagine in this world today being in love with somebody your family is going to disapprove of? Being in love with somebody that society looks down on. Can you imagine having royalty in my blood, having authority in my voice, having favor of the world all over my life? But I got to can't help it <laughs> for somebody that nobody else sees really much in. But let's keep on down, move further off into the text. The text teaches us that he fell in love with him to the point that he said, I'm going to give him my robe. I'm going to give him my tunic. I'm going to give you my sword. I'm going to give you everything that I have. And I can imagine Saul now looking at him funny for two reasons. Saul might have been saying to John, how are you going to give him something that really belongs to me? I'm the king. You're the child. But then another reason why he may have been looking at him funny, because if you go back to chapter 17, verses 38 and 39, you'll see that Saul gave him the same thing. 
Reverend Rowan, it's a good message right there worth preaching. Saul gave him his robe, his tunic, his sword. He gave him his garment around, for around his waist. He gave him everything that he had in order to fight Goliath. And he said, I can't wear this. It doesn't fit me, and I don't feel right in it. But here we see Saul's son come and offer him the same thing. And the Bible lets us know that he took it. Can I tell you what I see here in the text? You have to understand what these, this tunic and this robe and, and, and what the sword and all this represented. Let me break it down to you and walk through the text slowly if I might. First, he offered him a robe. This robe was just a garment that pretty much everyone had. But this robe was a little different because this robe was coming from royalty. This robe was given by the king's son. In other words, this wasn't just generic robe, a generic robe. This was name brand. This was, a, how they say, Givenchy. This was Ralph Lauren. This was the finest that the world had to offer. Gucci. He was given royalty as a common robe to wear. And then it said that it also gave him his tunic. Now this tunic could be a symbol of two, one or two things. It could be a priestly tunic or it could be one that was worn by military that showed that he was a soldier or a valiant warrior. I don't know which one it was, but I know that it was given by the king's son. And it was given to a pauper or a poor man's child. He was given the robe that royalty would wear. He was given the tunic that royalty would wear. And that showed symbolism. That showed that when you see someone in this garment, that you held them in high esteem and in great respect. And can you imagine being in love to the point to where I give you the very best that I have? But he gave him his robe, and he gave him his tunic, and he also gave him his sword. Now, we know what the sword was used for. The sword was used for fighting and protection. It was used for close combat. And this symbol shows that he gave him the ability to fight his enemy in close contact. He didn't have to pray that prayer, Lord, don't let it happen to me. He had the sword of the word with him, meaning that whenever it happened, I'm still ready to fight my battles. He was praying the prayer that, Lord, whatever condition I'm in, I won't let Satan put fear in me because I've got a sword now. And the sword is the word of God. And I fight my battles with the word of God because I've got it with me. And then he also said that I, I'll give him uh, uh, my tunic, my robe, the sword, and, and I'll be able to fight my battles. And he said, I'll give him my bow. And he, you know what a bow is for. The bow is also to fight a battle. But a bow is normally used not for close contact, but from when the enemy is far off. Or I can put an ambush on him. And you know what the bow is for us in life, don't you? When I know that the word of God has said in this life you will have trials, you will have tribulations. So since I know I'm going to have some trouble, and since I know I'm going to have some tribulations, since I know I'm going to be tempted and tested, I've got a bow that I can hit at long range. And you know what it is, just like I said this morning, when I woke up this morning, I had my mind stayed on Jesus. I was just drawing back my arrow in my bow. And I was just shooting out prayers and saying, Lord, whatever comes my way this day, would you handle it and, and guide me through it right now? Yes, sir. 
Lord, this day I woke up with joy in my heart. And Lord, I want to carry it with me when I'm around my enemies and my foes. I don't want to let anything separate me from my love. Reverend Roden, I'm just shooting my bow now. All right. And I know it's going to hit the enemy. Yeah. Because Lord, let me, Lord has let us know that whenever I call on the name of Jesus, demons tremble and Satan has to flee. So I can shoot in the darkness or I can shoot in the marvelous light. And I know that it's going to hit where God aimed. So he said, I'll give you my robe, my tunic, my bow, my sword, and my arrow. I'll give you everything. And I'm telling you again, it's not just from the average joke. Because it was first offered to David by Saul. David said, I couldn't wear it, and it doesn't fit me. But now, when Saul's son Jonathan offers it to me, it's a perfect fit. Can I tell you something you may not have seen, but the Lord has shown me. Saul was a man of the world. And let me tell you something, dear children of God. Sometimes the world can offer you the very same thing that God has for you. But the way you tell the difference, if the world offers it to you, it ought not to fit. You ought not to wear the world's blessings. But you ought to wear the blessings that come from God. I told you I liked, uh, 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 what, what's, what's his name, the, the singer, who says a house is not a home. Until love hits the That's right, big Luther, not little Luther. But this is what I'm saying is if the Lord doesn't give it to me, if the Lord doesn't give me my house, it can never be a home. If the Lord doesn't give me my relationships, they can never amount up to anything. If the Lord doesn't give me my work, I'll never be satisfied. If the Lord doesn't add his increase to my pay, it'll never be enough. If the Lord doesn't teach me the deep treasures of his word, I'll never have sufficient knowledge to maintain here on earth. If the Lord doesn't put love in my heart, I'll never be able to like my enemies well enough. I'd rather have what God has for me and let him give it to me by those who love me than to try to go out and get it on my own and let the world try to sell it to me. Because when, when Saul offered it to him, it was at a bargain price. But it was at a, 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 a time where he was really giving it to him because I was scared to do what I needed to do. I'm going to give you my sword because I don't want to fight. I'm going to give you my shield because I done dropped it and ran. I'm going to give you what I have, not because I think it's profitable, but because I'm afraid to use it myself. Yes. But I got to walk on down through the text. And ask, can you handle this difficult love dynamic? And here's what we see with Jonathan. Jonathan has fallen in love with David. And you know the story of David and Saul. Yeah. Both were anointed and appointed kings. Both were set in place by God. But now Jonathan has fallen in love with the second king. And he was already in love with his father. And now he has to watch his father show his true colors about the king that God chose. He had to watch his father listen and, and build up anger and hatred in his life and build it up to the point to where he just couldn't hold it in anymore. He had gotten into his spirit that I hate David. I want him dead to the point to where I need him gone ASAP. 
I need him gone. I hate him so much that I'd rather fight him who's helped me than to fight Goliath who's never done me any good. I'm afraid of Goliath, but I'm going to kill this one here that's sitting next to me. And Jonathan was caught up in a triangle of love. I'm in love with the one that my father hates. I'm in love. And then it's getting difficult on me because when I look at the one that I'm supposed to love who is my father, I can't see anything good in him. I can't see anything right in him. His time is consumed with doing harm to one who has done nothing wrong to him. His time is consumed. He can't run the country because he's too busy running David. But I love him because that's my blood. I love him because he has authority over me. I love him because he's the king. But I just can't see much good in him. And then it's getting real difficult because when I look at David, my love continues to grow because he's reminding me somebody that I'm going to talk about before I leave. You know the one I'm talking about, the one they said I find no fault in him. And I'll show you the similarities in the text a little later on. But Jonathan was looking at David and he's saying, David, I love you with my whole heart. David, there's nothing that I won't do for you. And if you keep reading about him, you'll find out there's some even over in Samuel that talks about him. You'll find out that he says, David, I know that one day you're going to be king. And my heart's desire is that I sit with you. I love you to the point that I want to serve you. And can you imagine being in love when you say to the fact that my dad is king and when his time is up, I ought to be next on the throne. But David, I see something in you to the point to where I don't even want to be king. I want to serve under you. I'll let you have the throne. I'm going to show you some similarities after a while. Don't forget about that robe that he wore. That was an earthly robe that he wore. And he's saying that now, when I look at you, David, you know my daddy hates you. You know my daddy wants you dead. But David, what makes me love you even more, you won't touch a hair on his head. You won't do him any wrong. And David, I know you're strong enough because you defeated Goliath. David, I know you're strong enough because you defeated many soldiers in battle. But the Bible sure says if you keep on reading in 18 that they begin to sing this song. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And David, I know you have the eye of the people right now. And then when I look at you, you've got the people on your side. And you're able to fight battles that the ordinary men are unable to fight. And then I know you have power enough to swing your sword. But you won't touch my daddy after all he's done to you. Let me come to 2020 for a little while. I'll be back. Can you imagine being in love with some people? that your parents hate. Can you imagine being in love with a generation that your forefathers despise their generation? And you know where I'm going with this. Can you imagine giving a person that does not have the benefits you have, giving them and surrendering your power to them because you know they are deserving of it. Are you willing to love or fulfill that love and give it over because you can't find no fault in it? 
How many of us are running around hating one another because our forefathers hated their forefathers? How many of us are strong enough to say that I'm not going to go with what my forefathers did. But I'm going to love them and I'm going to respect them. Because I can't hold them accountable for what somebody else did in the past. And I'm not going to be like my forefathers. I'm not going to waste my life running around hating them and trying to kill them. Knowing that they are offered the position of kingship, knowing that they can run things just as well as I can. I'm going to love them to the point to where I want to see us work together. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what their race is. I don't care what their, uh, uh, what their uh, education level is. They could have come from poverty, but they've proven that they are rich in love, rich in wisdom, they're rich in understanding, and I'd rather see them in leadership than to sit under rulership of my blood that's filled with hate, filled with uh, envy, and filled with strife. But I've got to turn the coin now. Can you be that, in, that person that can receive that type of love? Can you be that type of person that can say, I know that they hate me, but I still ain't going to touch a hair on their head. Can you be that individual that can say, I'm going to stay the course that God has set me on? And I'm not going to waste my life trying to get even and trying to get back. Because I know that one day I'll be put in that position. And I don't want to be known as one that couldn't run the position. Because my mind and my heart is consumed with hatred. I'm not going to hold the position to get even or to get over. Because I know where I come from, and I know where I'm headed. So can you be that one that can relinquish the position in order that the world be made better? Can you be the one that said, I'm not anointed or appointed to hold the position by God? In God we trust. One nation under God. That means that if God isn't running it, and you don't allow God's people to be the head of it, you don't have no reason to say one nation under God. You don't even get a chance to say one nation. Because whenever you put one in that's not under God's authority, you're not one nation under God, you're not even one nation. You're a world of individuals that can't see eye to eye, can't get along, can't see for the greater good of the country and of the life of man. And it works the same in relationships. If that marriage is not one marriage under God, it's going to be some smoke in the city. You know what we always say. We get caught up in worldly logic. If that woman ain't happy, then that house ain't going to be right. Well, let me tell you something. God put man over the woman, and he put man over his own house. And let me tell you something. If that man is under God, and he's not happy, it's going to be some smoke in the city. I spend too much time in prayer. And in meditation, I spend too much time with God asking him to lead the decisions that I make for the greater good of my house. For me to sit around to try to please my children or try to please God just to make peace. 
My mother taught me this. My mother says if a man is led by God and a woman and children don't want to follow, those are some women and children that need to walk out on their own. Because if they don't want to honor God, then they'll never honor you. And I ain't trying to tell you to leave and all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to tell you to follow under God's leadership. And if that man is not being led by God, you don't have to worry about leaving him because he's going to end up leaving if you're listening to the word of God. Well, I won't say that you'll, he'll end up leaving. I will say either he will leave or he'll get his act together because God is going to take care of all of his children, whether it be male or female. And if a male can't get it together and that woman is being led by God, you going to get in line or you going to get on about your business because God is going to protect and preserve all of his children. I don't got off course, but I got to get back now. But I'm just trying to share with you, or is, uh, can you handle this difficult love dynamic? Will you love the world or will you love who God has placed in authority? Will you get caught up in loving what you're traditionally around? Or will you step out of the box and say, for God I live, and for God I'm willing to die? Or are you willing to love enough to say, I forsake all, mother, father, children, and family, to follow Jesus? Or are you willing to say, Daddy, I've got to go, and I'm going to be with what you have made your enemy? But I find no fault in him, Daddy. Daddy, you've been trying to kill him. I remember a time, Daddy, that you wanted to kill him to the point to where you slung an arrow in the door as he was trying to flee from your presence. And, Daddy, it wasn't because you had a bad aim, but it was because you was targeting God's children. And can I tell you something? You can't hurt God's children except God takes his hand off of him. You can make your best throw, and you can, do your, you can make your hardest attempt. But God says, I got a plans for this man. He's one after mine own heart. And Saul, don't get mad because I didn't say it about you. But you ought to be happy that you had somebody in your corner because there were many that prayed for you. Because don't you remember when they came to the priest and said, give me a king like all the other nations. That means they was praying and telling the priest, go tell God to give us a king. And the Lord heard your prayer. Because the Lord said, I'm going to give you what they, what they asked for. He said, but I got a king for them. But you want this right now. And I'm going to let you have what you asked for. See, God is more than fair. He doesn't just give you what you need and what you deserve. Every once in a while, he give you what you think you want. And he gave them Saul. <laughs> Tall, good-looking, scary, and worthless. That's all man could come up with. Don't know what to pray for, don't know what to ask for. But God's grace says it won't be this way always. But now we've got Jonathan in love with the man that his father hates. And he watched all through life at how his father tried to kill him, continuously persecuted him, put him in positions that would take his life, but yet and still, Jonathan Love kept growing. He kept on, and, 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 and it got to the point, and, and, and I know this might offend some folks, and it's hurting your feel. How do you feel when your children well, or, or destroying your plot to, of the father to get his enemy. What I'm talking about is in scripture, you know that his daddy, Saul, plotted to get him. And <laughs> look at Jonathan. Jonathan said, I'm going to tell you everything. My father is letting me hear. 
so that you'll always have a way of escape. I told you there's some parallels in this picture. I'm going to give you a way of escape. I'm going to let you know where he's going to be and when he's coming and how he's going to try to entangle you so that you have a way of escape. David, I love you. But here again is what's teach, what is being taught in the text. Are you willing to put yourself in this difficult love dynamic? Are you willing to love despite what your loved ones are telling you? Or are you, are you willing to give up your position to the person that you know is right for the calling? Or are you willing to surrender yourself to where I'll give you what I have? And I'm, let me bag up a little bit. When he gave him his robe, his tunic, his sword, and when he gave him everything he had, Jonathan was saying, I'm willing not only to give you what I have, but to become like you are. When you really show true love for somebody, you are willing to put yourself in that person's shoes and also willing to lift them up and to put them in your shoes. I believe I say it again. You're willing to put yourself in that person's shoes and you're willing to change places with that person and become as them. Let me show it to you in the text. If I give you my robe, if I give you my tunic, if I give you my sword, if I give you my bow, if I give you what, God, what, the, what, what has been blessed of me to have, then I become as you are who has nothing. David did not have a precious robe. David did not have a precious tunic. David did not have a special sword. David did not have a spectacular bow. But when David received it from Jonathan, now he had everything that the king had to offer to his son. And now his son has become like David, a shepherd's boy, who had to fight with all that he had, who had to stand as a lowly shepherd's boy, he was willing to become a person that the world didn't look favorably beyond. But I hope you learned your lesson now because I got to move on out of here. But let me show you some parallel. I met a man a long time ago who came down and he wore a robe just like I, from his father. And he's going to put that robe on me one day. Because you know why? Because he's wearing my robe. For 33 years, he walked in an earthly robe. But then also he says, I've got a robe that comes from my military because the government was upon his shoulders. And also his robe was priestly. Because he was God's son. And then also, I've had his robe and I'll have his tunic. But he gave me a soul. Because he gave me his word. And he told me that if I hide it in my heart, I won't sin against him. And also, this word is a sword and it'll cut to and fro. It'll cut me out of trouble. It'll cut me through some trouble. And it also cut some trouble off of me. It's all in his word. And he also came with an arrow. And his arrow had some, some, some I could shoot my arrow. And it would protect me in the long run. I could defeat my enemy before I even got up to him. Can I tell you what that is? That's his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit has fought battles for me that I've never even seen before. He's protected me and guided me through dangers seen and unseen. But this man that I met a long time ago, he stayed with me and he loved me unconditionally. He loved me 
Even like Jonathan loved David. He loved him all the way to his death because this chapter 18 says that he made a covenant with him. I make a covenant with you and let you know how much I love you. And if you know anything about this message today, you will find out that David, I mean Jonathan stayed with his father Saul even unto death. But his love never died for David. Can I tell you what God did for us? He stayed with us when we were just like Saul and didn't do right. But he sent his son and his son died for us. I'm so glad that he died for us and he stayed with us and he stayed faithful unto death. But he said to David, uh, when, in David, when Jonathan's death, he still proclaimed and let the world know that David, I still love you. David, I still believe in you. David, I still trust you. And God still has a purpose for you, even though I'm gone. Still, God's still on the throne. So David understood that I've got to do my father's will. I've got to do what the Lord has for me. And I just wanted to show you some similarities and ask you, can you handle it? The difficult love dynamic. Who are you going to love? Who are you going to love the world and its righteousness? Or will you deny the world and forsake your loved ones? And follow after the one who God has set in order. It ought to be God's children in leadership. It's God's children who've been anointed and appointed. And if you want to make America great again, it's got to be one nation under one God. If you want your marriage and your relationships to work, it's got to be one marriage under God. Under this God. This is not a little G God. That's why I'm calling his name so loud. He is God all by himself. If you want to fix the community, it's got to be one community under God. If you want life to be made better, it has to be a life under God. You won't have love in the city if you have no God in the city. You'll have no community amongst people if you don't learn how to, uh, uh, um, humility amongst people. If you don't know how to humble yourself before the throne. You won't know how to communicate with others that don't look like you. If you don't learn how to love beyond a person's look, you won't learn how to be a better nation. I don't care how many times you feed folks. If you don't feed them the word of God, it's going to be some problems. It doesn't matter how many times you pay somebody's bill, but if you don't show them that you love them enough that you'll sit with them in darkness, you're not showing very much. You're just showing what the world has to offer. You're giving them Saul's tunic. You're giving them Saul's robe. You're giving them Saul's bow. And if it didn't work for him, it surely won't work for you. For God I live and for God I'm willing to die. And up on Calvary, let me tell you something that you won't do that he did for us. Up on Calvary, you know, scarcely will you find some that'll die for you. But up on Calvary, I've got a Savior that died for the whole world. I've got a Savior that hung, bled, and died. But that's not all he did. He rose again with heaven's glory on his mind. He rose again and gave us the free gift of salvation. God will bless you beyond measure. Are you willing to follow this love dynamic? That's the challenge today. Will you hold on to your history and your heritage when you know it's not right? Will you hold on to your traditionalism? Will you hold on to the things that you've seen proven to not work? Will you hold on to it? If everybody else is getting divorced because of it, why are you practicing the same behavior? If everybody else has been fighting, why are you doing the same thing and having the same fight? I told you, I'm getting a little older now. And I'm tired of fighting. And most people fight 
because they don't have any understanding. Most people fight because they're in a state of confusion. Most people fight because they are full of fear and doubt. God has not given you the spirit of fear. God has not given you the uh, place of confusion. God has told you to be wise in all things. Get you an understanding. God has told us, don't let yourself get into a position where you get out of character. And again, that's why you're fighting, because you don't know any better. And you're full of fear and doubt. And you can't conceive the thought in the heart of God. Because you got too much of the world in you. And quit watching others and letting that determine who you are. Bible says you got eyes, but you can't see. I better preach another message right quick. You've got eyes, but you can't see. And what that means is you got eyes and you keep looking at this little old fight. But you can't see the truth because the truth is not in what you see in front of you. The truth is what is in history. That's why the word tells you to think back and remember. If you look back and remember, it was trouble back then. And if it was trouble back then, there's nothing new under the sun. If it was trouble back then, if you get caught up in it, it's trouble up here. He says you got eyes, but you cannot see. You got ears, but you can't hear. You keep listening to I'm not smart. I'm not intelligent. I can't have what somebody else has. You've got ears, but you can't hear them. Because God told me that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God told me that if I want some wisdom, ask from him. See, you got ears, but you can't hear them because you're listening to the wrong thing. Can't nobody tell me who I am and what I'm not and what I cannot do and what I cannot become. Because God says I'm made in his likeness and in his image. How you going to call me dumb? I've been born again. I've been made just like him. I have the gift of understanding that he placed in me. You've got ears, but you just can't hear them. You sitting back telling somebody that you got a mental condition. But you don't have a mental condition. You have a spiritual condition. Because you talking to everybody else instead of talking to your creator. I, the Bible tells me that I ought to think like him, I ought to act like him, I ought to behave like him. And I've got enough sense to know that I'm not him, but I do know one thing, that I cannot ask anything of him. And he ne does not give it to me because he says, whatever I ask for in his name, it shall be given. So if I want some more knowledge, I'm not going to your school to get it. I don't need any more worldly knowledge. You've shown me what you have to offer, and it's death, hell, and destruction. But if I follow the word of God, heaven is my home, blessings on my life, prosperity is pressed down, stirred up, shaken again. You know what he'll do for you. I've learned how to lean and depend on him. I got to get out of here, y'all, but I ain't going to stop praising him. I've got to leave this place, but not his presence. God bless you.